So I see that you, uh, you know, when I first looked at your profile, I saw somebody who had gone to IIT Delhi, and then obviously you sort of done your PhD from UC Berkeley. And the first thing is that that thought crossed my mind is what is a computer science individual doing heading a business school? And and the thought came in like you know maybe he's the right person to head that school. And I really want to hear because it's very rare to see gifted computer science people leading a management education institution. So I would love to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, thank you, Alvin, for including me in the show. And actually, you know, the story of my own transition from computer science to business is. one of those you know moments of serendipity moments of you know accident that take you from one direction to the other in life which you cannot actually plan for i never planned to be in a business school to be very honest so i was in computer science in berkeley and then of course what happened is you meet people who influence your life in this case it was my to be wife and uh, she was on a fulbright scholarship and uh, the fulbright scholarship required her to come back to europe and so you know i was wondering what to do after i graduated whether to stay two years separate or whether to you know come back to europe but then we had a you know young baby a girl is now of course much older right now but so then we had to make the tough decision whether to what to do so the tough decision for me was essentially look for a job in europe and the job that i happened to get by a pure accident by pure you know coincidence was uh, in a business school called insia um Initially we thought we'd stay 2 years out there and then of course 2 uh, became 22 and then after 22 years I went to Cornell for and then after another 11 years I've come to Oxford right now so sort of my journey has taken me across you know continents back and forth and also from computer science to business now what is interesting is actually you asked the question what is a computer scientist doing in business school i think today the answer is as you said maybe the right person because you know everything in a business school everything in most sectors getting changed with technology but i must also you know remind you and remind our viewers that 35 33 years ago when i started in a business school people asked me actually what the hell are you doing out here you know because you should be in a computer science department you know in a business school you know computers are in the back office or not really strategic you know why are you in a business school so that question was a real one uh, i think 30 years ago but you know life has changed and now technology is the center of what business education is about what business is about and so i think i'm rather right place right now so you know without a doubt you know we have this is the age of uh, ai and data science uh, looks like the world is changing and uh, for a change the technology seems far more accessible uh, to regular people as well now very clearly i also mentioned that maybe you're the right person at the right time right now leading the right business school so what is your vision for a business school uh, keeping in mind these significant tectonic shifts in tech that we are seeing right now so you know i think what is very important for all of us to keep in perspective is that uh, you know we all know technology is progressing exponentially but if you look at an exponential curve for a long time it is not very really different from a linear curve but then there's a tipping point at which the exponential curve sort of hits the hockey stick part and it rises vertically and the moore's law has been active since roughly early 60s and you know we are now sort of 40 plus 25 60 65 years into moore's law and moore's law is in fact not slowing down it is accelerating and with quantum computing is going to accelerate even further So what is important is right now to realize that we are in this hockey stick mode of that technology shift or the technology curve which essentially means that the technology progress we have seen in the last 10 years is nothing compared to the technology progress in the next 10 years and the best manifestation of that is what you're seeing in the field of AI where a lot of changes are happening in the last 5 6 years literally the whole LNMs large language models is literally about 5 years old So you know it's very very recent technology and the power of the technology is increasing rapidly dramatically going forward. So when you look at technology impact on education uh, it is impacting education like any other business dramatically fundamentally and it will transform education in a very big way. The big question mark which is there for us in a business school at Oxford side and also for all business schools is how ready are we for the transformation. Uh if you take for example a simple thing like AI 
you know, AI can enter into every, each and every single part of the business school. Uh, of course, we have to teach about AI because our students have to go out in the work and in you know, a workforce and companies and they have to use AI in their own organization. Then we also have to think about how does AI simplify our own operations and help us to do things differently? For example, the MBA admissions, you know, the kind of focus which you have in your education network, Pagal Guy, you know, uh, can be done a lot by AI. Today, AI can actually advise students about what is the right program, what are the right choices to be made. The same thing happens with career advising. AI can advise students about what kind of careers and what kind of other kinds of benefits they can get in different opportunities. Uh, AI can also advise about academic advising. Now, if you push the frontiers a little bit more, AI can start taking over tutoring of, you know, subjects. Um, AI is not yet at the point at which can create new knowledge fundamentally, but a lot of what we do in a business school today or in a university can be taken over by AI. Now, what this means is that as a dean or as a leader of a business school, I have to think very carefully or we have to think very carefully about how we integrate our human talent, which is our students, our staff and our faculty, with this intelligent technology, which is becoming more and more intelligent. So this combination of technology and human beings in the workplace, in the business school context is a fundamental question. And I must say that, uh, you know, we don't have all the answers right now, but that's the direction that we're moving in. And we have to be much more clever and much more intentional about how we combine the two. So when we look at the fact that, you know, the world is transforming, the biggest change management issues come up when you're in such a historical institution like the Oxford University. And uh, in my experience, uh, private universities tend to move a lot faster, smaller. Now you have a lot of legacy as well. Now, the pros are very obvious to the average MBA aspirant. Uh, does it also become a con in, in the case of leading transformation, especially in the area of tech in an MBA? You know, I think on the whole, if I have to make a broad statement, it is so much better to have a strong brand like Oxford behind you because essentially what it means is that uh, the strength of what you're able to achieve is so much higher. Uh, the kind of experimentation which you may have to do create the future will require partnerships of various kinds, require close relationship with companies and different partners, different companies are much more willing to work with you. They actually want to work with you to help create the future because what is important out here is that Oxford doesn't know the full answer for education in the future, what is the business model, neither does any other leading American school. So we all have to co-create the future together, along with corporations, along with other international organizations, along with society. And I think a strong brand makes the experimentation process much more easier and much more impactful. Now, I think the important thing is that what is the degree of willingness of the leadership to experiment? And what is the degree of willingness of the organization to actually try out different things and adapt and be, you know, change ready. And that's where I think it's not a question of history. It's much more a question of the kind of leadership you have in the organization. And I say this because the very fact that institutions like Oxford have survived and led education, a sector for a thousand years means that they have adapted, right? So the technology shifts and other kinds of geopolitical shifts have happened over to history. And it means that the organization has been capable of it, of adapting and, and reacting, otherwise it would not survive. That's a very simple thing. You know, today you look at companies in the, you know, whether it's the S&P 500 or the, any other index, there's such a lot of turnover in the companies because companies cannot actually adapt and change fast enough. So there is something in the system, of course, the way it is organized, the way the ethos is built up that survives and that, that enables the survival thriving in change, which is, I think, a strength. But having said this, I think the most important thing is really the courage of the leader to try out different things, because let's take even a simple thing like assessment. You know, we have a certain mode of assessment that we do, you know, in every business school, every organization. Now with chat GPT and other kinds of LLM models being more prevalent, uh, you have to rethink the whole assessment process. It's a very it's sort of one small component of the educational process, but that has to be really thought. Now to rethink that, you have to have the courage, you know, uh, and that will require a lot of uh, experimentation and willingness to try out different things. And I think we can do it. You saw in the case of the COVID pandemic, how entire societies as a whole, you know, 
went through different models of evaluation assessment. Uh, there are societies where didn't have the school living exams, or the exams are not held at all. And it is true that maybe we didn't have the right solution immediately in the COVID. That doesn't mean it cannot be done. So the fact is that we have to experiment and evolve the solutions. And I think technology enables us to be creative on that front. So, uh, you know, uh, how do you think that business schools should rent their traditional mode of education with sort of uh, modern technology? Uh, we're already hearing about uh, some schools using ChatGPT as a uh, fundamental way. Please use ChatGPT to answer this question. And then we also have schools who are saying that, hey, listen, please don't touch ChatGPT. If we sort of figure out that you use it, we might sort of yeah, not look upon it favorably. So what do you see is that mix that you are looking for? See, I think the chat GPT is only one example of the kind of technology shift that is impacting business schools. Uh, but I think, okay, on the chat GPT issue, I, I think there is no choice but to embrace it. Uh, any school that doesn't choose to embrace it, I think is just doing it itself a disservice because A, students are using it and you can't literally stop access to students. So what you can do is educate students about how to use chat GPT more effectively. It's just like educating students about how to use online news more effectively, how to distinguish between fake news and the real news. You know, these are kind of educational components that we all have to embed into the school and not just for students, but also mainly for faculty, because faculty members are probably a little behind on the learning curve in many technology aspects. But I think, you know, uh, technology is changing the face of what a school represents. If you think, for example, you know, as a, as, a, as a dean of a school, my major expenditure, expense items in my budget are first and foremost on people, which is essentially faculty and staff, and second on buildings, and third on other kinds of, you know, services that we have to provide. And if you ask the question, how will technology impact how you look at the business model, it calls into question fundamental assumptions that we make about the number of people required, the kind of people required, uh, the number of physical buildings required, the mode of distribution of education. So I think, you know, these, these all are very big questions and the answers might be different for different schools. I'm not saying it's the same answer for every school, but I think each school has to experiment with different possible options and then make the choices that they think are the right ones for them. So uh, what do you think, Professor, are some of the choices that you're making or uh, making for Oxford? So that, you know, over the next couple of years, we will see that uh, these are the significant changes in technology and sort of bringing them within the school. If, if any, what are, what are some of the ideas that you have on the table right now? Yeah, so, you know, um, I've been here one year and a little more than a year. And, you know, it, it took me about a good six months to even understand the place because Oxford is a very large university, very complex, you know, historic university. And today I feel I have a good sense of what we need to do, what we, you know, direction we're headed. So clearly the strength of Oxford is the excellence in research and the kind of new ideas it creates. So a clear focus is that we are going to be investing more in research and the creation of original ideas. And that I think is the heart of the whole academic enterprise that we have out here which in effect means we have to hire more faculty, the research faculty and invest in more research faculty, which in effect means we have to link up with other parts of the university much more effectively. Let's say, for example, in climate, we don't have all the experts in the sciences to address the climate phenomena. So we have to link up with other parts of the university to be able to bring in people and colleagues that can actually help us address this complex phenomena more effectively. So research is number one sort of criteria investment in people, basically. The second thing that we're doing is we have to build out and invest more in the uh, technology infrastructure, technology capabilities that we have inside the school. Of course, we have a very good IT department that you know, runs the various IT shop and so on, but I mean the strategic technology capabilities that will impact the frontiers of education. And we have created an internal ed tech unit in the last six months called Oxford Side Online. And basically the whole purpose of Oxford Side Online is to, of course, create a synchronous, a synchronous education material, but also very important is to build a competence in technology frontier areas that we can experiment with. So for example, we are trying to experiment with AI, you know, 
implementing chat gpt and other kind of similar llm models into the organization uh, we're experimenting with nfts and trying to see can we actually apply these kinds of you know concepts to our all all product distribution portfolio uh, so we're trying to basically build our own internal edtech unit for that and then of course we have to look at infrastructure because the reality is that the world is a digital world a combination physical and digital world and so we continue to invest in infrastructure uh, we are building a whole new entire small mini campus focused on executive learning and the focus is really on not just building a nice building but really it's on trying to put the latest infrastructure and latest pedagogical uh, approaches embed them inside a new space because when you have a new space you can rethink the learning process so at a very high level of course those are the directions but then we also are going global uh, you know global is the nature of the world today despite the tendencies we are seeing of separation you know in, in different blocks uh, i think global is no option so we have a very global student body already about 95% students come outside the uk but uh, clearly you know we want to be more even more global so those are high level directions but there are of course other things we're doing besides that too so i was speaking to uh, professor sergey netisen at wotton and very interestingly it looks like with respect to technology they're doubling down on simulations and their whole point was that business simulations are or the old style simulations are sort of you know uh to basic and sort of now they're literally building maybe ai authors you could sort of you know ask for information send emails to and these authors could sort of respond back with information so uh that is sort of one technological edge i've seen uh wotton pulling in uh you also have sort of seen you must have seen enough of them in the uk so what do you feel are like you know uh potential areas that you would want to bet on so i think you know uh simulations of course the generic category of learning that has been around for quite some time and simulations can be even simulations with you know board games paper games paper based simulations and of course there are computer based simulations too and of course you can extend it and say we'll have metaverse based simulations and other kinds of more complex simulation so simulations essentially for me represent a mode of learning which is experiential so i think what is happening right now is technology can of course enhance the experiential nature of learning and you saw that already today you know many cases in the covid environment people didn't have the ability to go and visit do plan tours or go and visit other foreign locations and people actually innovated and said well let's actually do a virtual plan tour you know let's actually go a virtual plan tour and you can give a, do a plan tour by sitting in your classroom and just seeing what is happening in a factory far away um the technology also enables it to connect people more effectively so i think today many simulations and other learning approaches connect people in different cultures different countries together so you can actually have much more richer learning experience with the student so i think you know uh, the category of learning of experiential learning is going to basically get richer like any other category of learning is going to be more widespread used and so i think that's a very good area to invest in and we are investing in it also you know there's no question all all schools are investing in it uh but i think the the more fundamental questions are really around as what i said earlier is you know the resource allocation point of view how much are we allocating in people versus building versus innovative new technology so i think it will always come down to that as they say you know you can you can figure out a man's interest based on what he spends on So exactly that's that's true for companies and you know however large the organizations and uh, i think spending on professors etc i think still forms the biggest part of uh, every institution's uh, budget and so do you expect any uh, any significant changes in them uh, in the years going forward no as i mentioned at the start in previous in a response that we are doubling down on investing in professorial research talent that can help us create new ideas so i think what distinguishes human experts human beings top universities is the quality of the research they do you know you went to wharton i'm sure you know something about wharton's research attracted you of course the network alumni also is very important but at the heart of it what makes the university and the institution great is the quality of research it does and the same thing is true for oxford too um you know i just i produce something called the global innovation index in which we look at the ranking of different parts of the world innovation 
And we just released uh, yesterday the ranking of the top science and technology clusters in the world. And in the top three are Cambridge, San Jose and Oxford. You know, so you see in the top three science and technology clusters in the world are these three great areas driven, of course, by three great institutions. So, so being in Oxford, we don't have a choice but to keep on investing in top quality human talent that can create new ideas. Now, of course, what you also hope is that that kind of faculty investments in turn attracts the best students, right? right? Because the best students come here, they get inspired, they get educated, and they go and in turn change the world. Like you are helping influence and change the world in a you know in your own way in India and other places. We want our students to go and go out and have a positive impact in the world around them. And that's what actually happened. So I think the investment in people is going to continue for sure. You know, I think both clearly at Oxford and I'm sure in other top institutions also. So, uh, you know, I remember you were uh, you were the vice chair and the chairman of uh, AACSB International, right? And so I think you, the chair, yeah. you, and, and so you had a very good view of what's happening in the US, uh, what kind of challenges they're facing. And now you sort of flew yourself to Europe. And so uh, what are some of the things that you feel are extremely different and things that you feel that you want to adapt or adopt from uh, from the US? You know, I think the, so I've had the benefit of working in the U.S., studying in the U.S. for many years, and I love the country also, despite the many faults. Um, I think what is very attractive about the U.S. is that it gives you the sense of ambition, uh, which is very important. You know, it gives a sense of hope uh, that you can do great things, uh, that you can become very rich. I'm not trying to make judgments about whether rich being rich is good or bad or, you know, that kind of judgments on inequality in salaries and so on. But the ambition level of reaching beyond what you can, you, what you thought you could do, I think is very important because that's what defines human beings in some sense. And I think the U.S. is very good at giving a sense of ambition. Uh, of course, not everyone, you know, succeeds to the same degree and there are a lot of people who don't. But still, it you have the sense that I can, you know, if I try hard enough, if I try a little bit more, I can do it. Uh, in Europe, it's a little bit different. I think clearly some sense of the ambition is still there. But in Europe, it's much more a question of let's try to make sure the world is a better world. So there's a much more of a focus on, I'm, I'm speaking very high level, so there's much more of a focus on let's ensure the planet is sustainable. Let's ensure that we all lead better lives. So it is... Of course, people have personal ambitions, but the personal ambition is subordinate to societal good and to planetary good. And I think that's a very important distinction in terms of the culture and ethos that you see in the U.S. versus uh, uh, U.S. versus uh, uh, Europe. And that, I think, is, is an interesting point of difference in the culture of students you get, the kind of selection of students you see out here. Of course, Europe is more global, you know, because it's by nature global and People come here with more global perspectives. U.S. is much more U.S. centric as you went to education yourself. You probably saw that education, the interests of students are all largely U.S. dominated. So the discussion in the classroom gets largely U.S. dominated. So a perspective is very constrained by the large successful economy of the U.S. So that's also happens. But also what is interesting, I've seen the U.S. recently, I think the last 10 years, is that um, tech has become very sexy. So, you know, 20, 30 years ago, technology was not seen as sexy. Being a sexy you know, programmer was not seen as, you know, something sort of attractive career to have necessarily. Good career, but not attractive career. But now what has happened is so many tech entrepreneurs have become so successful that being a software geek and being able to produce companies of value, of success, is really seen as a very high of career role model. And I think that same level of sexiness and technology is not yet there in Europe. Of course, it is, you know, it is appreciated and it is there, but it's not the same degree. I think largely because you don't have those mega success stories of tech entrepreneurs that you have today in some countries, mainly the US, but also China and India to some degree. So that's an interesting point. So, you know, so in some sense, the ambition of the average student who's sort of getting into a European school, you know, he's more thinking about, let me let me figure out how I fit into this world and how this world is exactly. in a place. And sort of mostly you're saying the American schools are more dominated around, hey, listen, can I, do I have an idea that makes the next billion dollars? 
And the entire environment is also conducive for you to think about a billion dollars. It's not something that you would feel odd, you know, talking about. But if you exactly, were... and I think the, I think the US also what the general mode is. I'm not saying people are not concerned about the environment, but the first thing is that let me first make my first billion, and then I will give hundred million to the environment. You know, I will help the environment after I make my first billion. Right. And I think in Europe the mode is a little bit more that. I don't need to make my first billion. Let me just make the first, you know, half a million, and let me make sure the environment is, is sustainable. So I think that's the distinction. The U.S. is that let me make my first big pot of money, and then I will be generous and give money from that pot to help the world. Uh, but that's that, that's a different kind of approach, which is I think quite you know unique. So uh, my question was around uh, how does this change anything in the way you're identifying students who are applying to the SET school? Are you looking for students with more ambition? Is there something that sort of you know makes you feel like you know I think this is going to be the direction for the next couple of years? Yeah, I think you know that in that sense I'm lucky because the choices are made not by me but my predecessors. So I think you know Oxford, the side business school being born inside Oxford University, has but and has this societal impact, the good of the world in its DNA. Because that's what the university is about. If you think, for example, uh, the example of the university creating the vaccine, mm -hmm. it shows you two stories, two two parts of the two important messages. The story. So one is that, you know, it was the only university in the world that created a vaccine, and the reason it did so is because there was deep research out here. You know, you don't just wake up one day and say, "I'll create a vaccine." You create a vaccine. No, you could you cannot do that. A lot of research required to do it, and that research existed that shows the depth of the research in the university. That's the first point. Second point is that uh, it chose a partner, AstraZeneca, under the condition that AstraZeneca would distribute the vaccine at cost in emerging markets. And so it probably lost several tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of dollars in royalties. Uh, at a benefit of having saved maybe tens of millions of lives. Now, that's a choice which was made, which is very telling of the ethos of the university. Many of the universities might have said, well, let's give a 20% discount to the emerging markets and let's get $20 million more. But I think, you know, what Oxford did this choice is very telling of the ethos of the university. And that ethos is part of the DNA of the school, the side business school. So the side business school, I would say, made the choice to focus on impact, good of the world, good of the society, and so on, 30 years ago, when impact on these broader set of stakeholders was not even being discussed in business schools. Today, of course, the world has changed and every school you know, wants to do that and is talking about doing it. But I would think that uh, the side business school, because of its sort of history, because of its you know, DNA from Oxford, is much more credible, much more authentic, and that's, I think, what distinguishes a lot of what we do inside the school is uh, it's much more impact oriented, much more, you know, uh, looking at how to do good for the world. Let me give a simple example. Uh, many schools have programs on family businesses. And most schools that teach family businesses teach you about how to run a family business well, how to solve intergenerational conflict, how to manage transition. Those are the usual, very important, I'm not saying not important, very important family business discussions. In the school, we also have a major focus on what is called impact through the family wealth. So you have a family business, you have family wealth, and there's a very important question of how do you deploy that family wealth so that you do good in the world? And that's a very important question that now family businesses are facing. This is the core focus of a project that we have called the Ownership Project 2.0 uh, that really talks about how to deploy and how to get family businesses to get more focused on using the wealth and the power to do good for the world. So that's the kind of difference that I think, you know, uh, you see in Oxford, which is very interesting and very, you know, I think inspiring. So can you tell me how do you measure success? It's a good question. And I think, of course, you measure success in different dimensions, your personal and also your you know, professional. I think the professional dimension, uh, clearly, for me, the success of our students is a reflection of my success. Uh, if the students that we graduate become successful in what they do, if they feel they are more 
let's say, empowered and prepared to face the world and, in fact, create a better world for tomorrow, I think that's the ultimate measure of success. Of course, as a professional, I also create new ideas myself, my own modest way. And uh, let's say my research on global innovation, which is used by 110 or more countries in the world today, gives me some sense of satisfaction that I'm able to influence the direction of innovation policies in some countries, including in India, for example. India, for example, the Indian Innovation Index, you know, is formulated on the basis of the Global Innovation Index. And that is influencing how different states change the approach to innovation and investment policy. So that's a measure of my success, of my impact on the world. So that's something very important. And of course, personally, you want to have, you know, a very good, happy, personal and, prof- and personal and healthy life. Yeah. So uh, are there any uh, current tie-ups or collaborations that you are considering with Indian business schools or you feel that uh, that's an area of growth for the for the Oxford University as well? So, you know, we work with a number of uh, Indian schools and we work individually, our faculty work with a number of Indi- uh, faculty in, in Indian schools, but we don't have a significant institutional partnership as yet. And uh, this partly because India has a very strong presence in Oxford because of historical connections, you know, in that sense, the connection to India is very strong already. Uh, and also partly because the collegiate system of Oxford, you know, means that uh, all the degree education essentially is linked to the presence on the Oxford campus here in the city. So there are constraints out here in terms of the degree of, uh, let's say, depth of the institutional partnership that can be actually offered to any partner. But we do work with many universities and we keep intent to working with many universities in India, you know, at different levels of uh, engagement and different levels of partnership. Okay. And I think uh, I'm off my final question. So when you're sort of admitting an MBA candidate, what do you, what are the two or three top critical factors that you uh, look at while evaluating uh, an applicant to the same business? You know, it's a, first of all, there's no typical MBA applicant. So, so it's a, you know, it's very difficult to mm-hmm. define a typical one, but what we are looking for is diversity of profiles. So we want the, you know, the, technology software engineer who has done very well. We want the music student who is, you know, interested in looking at how to actually develop perhaps music as a business later on. We want other kinds of profiles of people who have built social entrepreneurship businesses or organizations that have done, you know, societal good in different ways. And I think really the ability of the MBA to give a broad, rich experience is to combine different profiles. So, if I had to ask you, you know, what does my team look at? My team looks at trying to build diversity and, and enhance diversity. And this could actually include having students having no degrees whatsoever. Uh, students who have had uh, different backgrounds. Uh, you know, recently one student in my executive MBA program came and told me that he was so happy that Oxford, you know, made a bet on him and he's graduating now with success. And he was a heroin addict for 20 years. Okay, and then he built up a successful uh, small little car business. He realized he came out of the, he left the habit. He built a small car business, and now he did an executive MBA, and he's starting in a whole new MBA, you know, a whole new career out there. So you have different experiences out there in the profile, and I think that's very important. We want the best and the brightest, and we want the people who have different life experiences. Now, having said this, they all have a common few elements. They all want to learn. If you don't have a desire to learn, you will not make it. Second, they all have some basic level of intelligence, you know, EQ, IQ, and so on. Otherwise, you will not be able to, you know, pass your courses. If you can't pass your courses, you can't get through the program out here. Uh, And very important, they have a desire to do good for themselves and for the world. Now, the way they see it varies from student to student. You know, each student has got a different vision of uh, what they want to do for themselves and for the world. But the desire to do something good for others and for themselves, I think is very important because uh, I think we hope that our students, you know, be more than what they thought they could be 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. And that we play a small role in inspiring them. So what I hope fundamentally is that we attract, you know, bright minds, uh, different experiences, different profiles, and then we inspire them so that they go out there and, you know, be the best that they can be and do good for the world. 
Uh, Professor Dada, thank you so very much for your time. Uh, I feel like you've, you've just entered this institution and I think you're going to bring in some of the best from the West, if you will. And I think you're going to be taking this institution places. So I do hope that I get a chance to maybe speak to you maybe next year once more. Would love to hear uh, how your initiatives are, uh, are are being put out there into this world because I think a lot of institutions would look up to uh, Oxford for innovation in education. And I think that you would be uh, instrumental in putting that to the ground. So I would really love to see that. So thank you so very much for your time and uh, I hope to see you soon. No, thank you very much for inviting me. And uh, you know, one final message to all the so people who listen to this program or see this program is that uh, you should consider Oxford, uh, the side business school seriously, because I think, you know, this is a unique institution. You'll get a unique experience. You can get a business education in many schools, no question about that. But I think here you get a great business education and plus much more. So that's the Oxford touch. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Thank you. See you. Bye-bye.